I convey the very warm greetings from the people and government of the Republic of Kenya to this august assembly and to the great people of Djibouti. Let me take this opportunity to reiterate before this house the deep appreciation by the government of Kenya and myself for the high compliment from my dear brother, His Excellency President Ismail Omar Gray, President of the Republic of Djibouti, by his invitation to me to undertake an official visit to this wonderful country and for the warm welcome and delightful hospitality extended to my delegation and I since our arrival yesterday. We are grateful for the gracious consideration and we do not take anything for granted. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, sir, I thank you for the extraordinary privilege of this opportunity to address this house, which is also a tremendous honor for the people of Kenya. This is a remarkable gesture which demonstrates and affirms the strong, warm, fraternal relations between our two nations, our two peoples, and testify to our mutual trust and friendship based on shared values. For 46 years, Kenya and Djibouti have en enjoyed strong bilateral relations conducted in various spheres of endeavor and anchored on robust diplomatic engagement. The commercial trade and investment ties have been growing and indicate potential to involve greater numbers of people and farms and larger volumes of capital in the years to come. It is a fact of history and historical record that Kenya and Djibouti are founding members of the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, IGAD, a regional organization which has made significant and positive contribution to the peace, stability, and development of our region, and which continues to drive the region's pivotal agenda in conflict early warning, mediation, and conflict resolution, counterterrorism, food security, environmental production, economic cooperation and regional integration among other transformative interventions. I take great pride in citing the achievements of IGAD in this region, especially in terms of coordinating our partnership and managing our complementarities to reinforce our shared commitment and deliver opportunities for the achievement of peace, stability, security, resilience of agriculture and food systems, environmental sustainability and adaptation to our unique and dynamic climate as preconditions for the socio-economic transformation of our region. IGAD's ability to be consistent and effective in a context characterized by intensifying geostrategic complexity points us towards the quality of solidarity required for regional organizations like IGA and multilateral institutions to meet the needs of our time. I am happy to state that Kenya and Djibouti remain united in, com in, the, in their commitment to strengthen the critical regional mechanism like IGA. I therefore take this opportunity to thank the government of Djibouti for its steady commitment and unwavering support for IGAD, especially as the organization's gracious host. <clears throat> Aside from IGAD, Kenya and Djibouti are brought together by a common goal of promoting peace and stability in the Horn of Africa through other mechanisms. We are both troop contributing countries for efforts aimed at stabilizing Somalia and combating terrorism through the Africa Union's transition mission in Somalia.
ACMIS, as well as its precursor, the Africa Union Mission in Somalia, AMISO. These efforts represent our shared commitment to collaborate consistently in the pursuit of our mutual interests bilaterally, regionally, multilaterally, for the benefits of our peoples. The Horn of Africa has endured its worst prolonged devastating drought on record. As a result, our countries have sustained unprecedented loss and damage to infrastructure, property, and livelihoods, as well as threats to human security. Millions of animals have perished due to loss of pasture and water. As a result, millions of people have been displaced, impoverished, and pushed to the brink of starvation by unprecedented climatic phenomena, utterly beyond their control and capacity to understand, adapt, or mitigate. What we are experiencing in terms of such extreme weather and climatic conditions are nothing more than the adverse impacts of climate change arising from the discharge into the atmospheric into the atmosphere of greenhouse gases by the manufacturing industries of Western economies and industrial powers. The science of the matter is now clear and direct. First, the rise in global temperatures that is distorting climate patterns and occasioning catastrophe throughout the world is a consequence of industrial emissions. Secondly, global economic patterns amply demonstrate the connection between the greatest emitters responsible for over 95% of these dangerous discharges and the greatest rate of consistent economic growth. Thirdly, Africa, the lowest emitter and beneficiary of polluting industrial enterprises, is suffering the most intense, frequent, and devastating of the consequences of climate change. Aside from the terrible effects of extreme weather phenomena, including flooding and droughts, climate-related disease outbreaks, and erratic weather patterns, African countries have been forced to contribute more than their fair share of national resources to necessary adaptation efforts. At the moment, the continent is losing more than 10% of our GDP to adverse impacts of climate change. At present rates, Africa will forego all prospects of development through economic growth as more and more of our resources go towards coping with climate change just to guarantee the survival of our people. The injustice of the matter is monumental and staggering. 54 countries only contribute 4% of greenhouse gas emissions, yet they have to bear the brunt of loss and damage arising from the unabated rise in global temperatures.